Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hello, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit, and I'm here with Bill Norton, co-founder of Noya. Hi, Bill. Thanks so much for joining us. How's it going? Fantastic to be here. Thank you so much. This is great. I've been uh, hearing a little bit about Noya, and it stands for the Networks Optimized. How does that work? What is that called? Network Optimized Internet Acceleration. Basically, uh, all of us are using the public internet, and it's a way for us to share bandwidth in the occasions when things aren't working properly, or in order to ensure a better internet path than what you get by default internet routing. So sort of like if you were to be driving uh, down this, like when you're in an Uber and they use Waze and you're like, why are you going this other way? And they're like, oh no, I've anticipated there's a blockage up ahead. We're gonna hop over onto a side street. But also if like with this kind of internet connection, if it's a little bit glitchy, your technology would pretty much take care of that, right? Oh, well, that's right. That's a very apt analogy, in fact. Uh, the technology uh, that we have will monitor the ongoing internet session, and when we see packet drops or, or congestion artifacts, then we'll take a look at the alternative paths to get there. Oh, that's just so- like, yeah, I'm sorry, just like Waze will constantly measure where these cars are on the highway to detect that there's congestion and alternative routes, uh, we are monitoring the internet path that's being used and the alternative paths that are available by constantly measured like every second or two. Uh, So we'll know in advance whether this is going to be a good path for you or not. Oh, that's really cool. That is very cool. So how long do you feel it's going to be until you're deploying this uh, technology? Uh, We have a couple of months of of, of pipeline to to go through and then we'll have a, a public release. Uh, folks can download. It's open source software. It'll uh, download and run on a, a, a Docker on your, your machine. And in that way, it'll provide you the additional routing capabilities that aren't inherent in the public internet. Okay. You see, the public internet will send traffic along the shortest path, regardless of whether there's network congestion like we're experiencing on this video call or not. So a router will happily just keep on sending that traffic as fast as it can across a congested link. Well, what we're saying is um, we're using technology called segment routing that allows us to instead force traffic along a different path. So instead of going directly to you during times of congestion, we'll send that traffic to a segment router that will find an alternative path to get to that final destination. And in doing so, you can bypass congestion, or if you prefer, you can simply send all of your traffic along the best, lowest latency, lowest packet loss path which is different than how the public internet works today. That is so cool. How did you even think this up? I mean, it sounds like you were, you've been deep in tech for a long time, but how did this occur to you? Do you remember the moment where you were like, oh, this is a thing, I need to go make this or write about this? Well, um, it's kind of funny. Um, the technology was assumed to already exist. Okay. So how does it work? And through a process of reverse engineering, how this type of system probably works. Um, That's kind of how the genesis came up. And then I started modeling this using uh, cloud virtual machines around the world to see, well, how often will these glitches pop up? And when there are glitches where we would prefer to go through the segment routing path, um, how long of a duration will that last? Right. That's the kind of uh, math that we started doing. And it starts looking like though there are actually large periods of time, like minutes to hours, when traffic will be kind of in this weird state. I'll give you an example. Um, I was measuring traffic between Tokyo and Ashburn, Virginia. Okay. And for the longest time, 
the latency was, I'm going to make up these numbers because I don't remember the actual numbers. For the longest time, it was like 174 milliseconds. And then for some it jumped up to 225 milliseconds and stayed there for an hour. And then it came back down after a couple hours back to 174 milliseconds. Huh. Um, and it, I traced it down as to the, the core root cause. And it turns out there's some optimization happening by the cloud providers that shifts traffic to load balance. Unfortunately, my traffic got diverted to a more circuitous path to get to the destination. Got so it. this is a great example where our software can detect, oh, look, the latency just got much worse. What are the other paths? Right. So that will stabilize your, your network performance across the, across the board. And what the coolest thing is that this is all happening, but all of us collectively leveraging the rich diversity that all of the transit providers in the world are providing to us. Right. It's just the internet routing just doesn't always uh, find all those alternative paths. That's what we're providing. That is so cool. Now, yeah. you wrote this white paper, and that's sort of like, that was the big splash of this concept, even though you thought the concept had already been explored and was being acted on. So that's pretty cool. But there's a crypto aspect to this, right? That's right. Um, the, the idea is that you're sharing your spare capacity, your spare network bandwidth. Um, and why, by doing so, you're earning coins. Okay. You're earning coins by relaying the traffic for others. You can use those coins then when your internet connectivity is not working out quite so well. You then uh, spend those coins in order to use that better internet path. And it really, the cryptocurrency is really there to ensure fairness. Right. There are some companies that probably don't want to relay traffic for others. Maybe there are security concerns. Maybe there's some... Um, compliance reasons. And for those companies, they may just buy Noia coins and use those coins in the event when there's a problem. Right. That it, makes a lot of sense. Another interesting application of this Noia network um, system is for SLA credits. Now, today, if you have a problem, you can contact your ISP and complain, maybe turn in some data, they'll investigate, and maybe they'll give you some credit Maybe. For the downtime. That's not really what you want. What you really want is remediation. Right. And that's what this thing provides. If the ISP gives you an SLA with um, escrowed Noia coins that can be spent in the unlikely event that their ISP network is not providing you the connectivity you need, you can then use those Noia coins and get access to that better internet path during those times of, of pro there being problems. So is that to me is... Go ahead. That's huge. That's amazing. Is there a way that people can get Noya coins now if they can pre-purchase them ahead of time and become members or how does that work? I don't know the answer to that question. Is that because it might it might border on the idea of an ICO and you don't want to be pre-releasing coins in, in the event that somebody would think that that's a security? Um, I understand the, the issues that, that you're raising. I, I simply don't know the logistics today if you want to go and buy the coins. I know that we're listed on KuCoin. Okay. Um, right now, my focus, though, is not so much on those coins, but on the underlying system that makes all this work. Right. The coins are really the utility token that enable yep. the fairness and the sharing. Yeah, absolutely. That is so cool. So I'm in real estate. I'm launching a real estate technology company that's securitizing real estate. And we see that there's a lot of opportunity in opportunity zones. This is a, a zone of real estate that was sort of determined throughout the U.S. and Puerto Rico to be areas that have economic depression of some sort. And so they're trying to incentivize. This came out of the um, current administration, I don't want to say the word, but um, it came out of the current administration and it is um, an incentivizing tool to bring capital investment into the real estate in depressed areas that need more investment. Also, it, prov it comes with a tax shelter for people that otherwise would be taxed heavily on short-term capital gains. They can transfer directly into opportunity zone investment and they're out and they and they're have a, a shelter for up to 15 years. So because of that, uh, we are looking at how to deploy capital there the best. And one of the main uh, incentives is that you have to make capital improvements. And to turn homes into smart homes is a, a no-brainer. So partnering with other blockchain companies to not only securitize and tokenize real estate, but also to make significant investments that bring blockchain technology into homes as an infrastructural uh, capital investment is, is um, 
a big focus in our company right now. So it's very interesting to see what you're able to do for the individual consumer in their homes, making their internet basically, and by our determination, smart internet, right? It's smart speed. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting. I think the, the entire world is kind of evaluating where does cryptocurrency and blockchain fit in to these old school types of inefficient systems. Right. And that sounds like a home. great way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, we've got to circle back and follow up on that because I'm, I'm definitely putting together our partners and our partner coins that we can bring into our ecosystem so that people who are tokenized in tokenized real estate assets, they can also potentially use these coins in different ways and we can bring more value and circulation. So um, this is a very cool concept. Yeah. I had no idea that we would just like stumble into an overlap like that. That's very neat. So yeah. you've been in tech for a very long time though, right? This is, you were, this is not your first rodeo. That's right. Um, I, I started um, at Equinix um, in 1998. Wow. I was a co-founder and chief technical liaison for Equinix. Uh, we started with uh, a 25,000 square foot data center in Ashburn, Virginia. It was a cornfield. Ah. And um, that turned into uh, a very large uh, Equinix facility. The company took off and grew. Uh, the market cap today is about 40 billion. Wow, that's so it was, incredible. Um, it's really amazing to see. Uh, I, I didn't um, participate in a, the large chunk of that upswing, by the way. Uh, <laughs> when I cashed out, I think the company was worth $3.6 billion. Oh, wow. Uh, and since then, uh, the, the, the management team has just done a great job of, of accelerating the growth and lots of acquisitions, lots of, uh, lots of really good work by those guys. That is very cool. And so uh, did you go to school for like computer science or how did you, where, what did you study yeah. at school? I went to a small upstate New York college called Potsdam College where I studied computer science. Oh, very cool. And, and uh, uh, sorry. No, I was going to say, you probably noticed the guitarist behind me. Yeah. Um, I, I played in a band all through high school and all through college. We, we played out at the bar scene, uh, pretty much gigged every weekend. So I, I like to think of myself as having a computer science major with an under, uh, uh, kind of a, a minor in um, uh, playing in a rock band. Well, that's amazing. I've actually heard um, that the the way that the brain, the musician's mind works is actually very much like the way the mathematician's brain works. And it's the same structured organizing of, of information according to just a, a, a rhythmic data set, but not, but in the same way, it's like the same pathways that the mind needs that the mind goes down to uh, to be able to solve basic equations and things like that too. So you actually, it seems like those are two sides of the the same the same interest in a weird way. Yeah, it, it, it's a very similar uh, analogy. Of course, music you have the repeat bars, and computer coding you have loops. Yeah, uh, yeah. you have no notifications on individual notes to accent them or do them softly or the duration. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, they're very similar. Yeah, super similar. That's interesting. So you were always a sort of hybrid musician and computer scientist. And then when I went to work at um, the University of Michigan for 11 years, uh, I worked oh. for the Merit Network, which operated the core of the internet called the NSF net. And my role there was to write network management and network monitoring tools that made sure the core of the internet was working. This so was back in 88, 89 kind of time frame. So monitoring the internet is something you've been doing for a long time. It's just a, a matter of monetizing that and also distributing that is the new kind of blockchain add-on to the second wave of the internet that you've been able to capture and write about and launch around. Well, well that's right. And you know, one of the great things about network management is um, there's a lot of learning that happens. And that learning is incredibly valuable because when you find things that are anomalies or weird and you dig a little deeper, if you have that curiosity, uh, you, you can learn a lot about how the underlying system works. Um, the things like predicting when a link is going to go down based upon seeing small numbers of errors turn into larger number of errors over days. Ah, um, cool. So I was able to find uh, microwave links that were about to degrade and go out, and we were able to switch onto a different link before they actually kicked out. Oh, so it's very great. cool, very like 2001. Yeah, very 2001. Yeah. So if people were interested in getting more involved in Noya and getting one of these boxes in their own home and being a part of the network, how would they do that? What's the, what's the launch or the, the timeline or the roadmap for really consumer acquisition for you guys? Yeah, I, I think the, the best avenue forward is to uh, keep tabs on Noya Network. 
Uh, there's a Telegram channel, and there's a lot of active discussions about the technology, about when things are going out, about the, the coins and, and how the coins will be used and how they're infused into the system and how um, supply is limited. All that kind of stuff yeah. uh, is being discussed on that channel. And uh, th this is by far the most open and transparent company I've ever worked for. Huh. So um, as a company... Everything that we're doing is pretty much out there, shared with the community, in response to the community. And as a result, a lot of the software is open source. Very so we cool. expect that people will be building on top of this. And really, this is a system that we all would like to have in place. Right. Um, you know, if you think of us as a global internet community, the idea of us being able to, to share the resources of, of other folks in order to get con connected ourselves. It is just a very good public kind of project. Absolutely. That's wonderful. I'm so glad that you're leveraging the open source system as well, because that's I think that that's really the, the future of, of all all of this, the blockchain systems, especially everything is about sharing. It's not like there's it's such an open space that we don't even have competitors in this space. We just have collaborators, which is it's a lovely time to be involved in tech. Oh, well, that's right. And in addition, um, the open source software allows everyone to see what is being installed and run on my machine. Right. Uh, you know, the kimono is open and you can look at the code, you can see how it works. And uh, that's how bugs get fixed. And, and that's how we maintain transparency and allow folks to, to build and grow on top of the system. That is so cool. Well, that's wonderful. I know we're going to have links below this um, this video so people can check out all the things that you guys are doing. You're basically, what, two, three months from launching? Is that right? Uh, two or three months from the software being available for download and, and, and running. Very uh, cool. Yeah, we've been doing a CDN for a long time now. There are thousands of nodes that are uh, in the system already. This is kind of an extension beyond that into, uh, a, I think, a much broader vision to provide better internet for everybody. Absolutely. Well, this is so exciting. I just, I, I'm really glad that you were able to come on the show and tell us a little bit about this. I feel like even though it's, it's kind of deep tech, it's also, it was so easy to hear what it was from, like what actually is going on with you because a lot of times technicians just kind of get so deep into their code speak that I have to pull them out and pull them out. But I can tell you, your brain works in both halves must be the, uh, the musician in you because <laughs> you explain you really basic terms and it's really refreshing. So thank you so much for, for talking to us about the Noya and to show us kind of what we're going to have as options in the future to not have glitches in our video or internet connections in the future. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for having me. <laughs> but, um, well, this is great. I guess um, I'm going to sign off now. And uh, Bill Norton and I have been, it's been a great pleasure talking with you. And I will catch you guys next time on the New Trust Economy. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.